is indicated it's just gone past two o'clock. I'm very pleased that those of the um, electric bus that was outside we didn't get back in on time. Um, so it's great to see everyone here for today's um, transport committee meeting. Uh, do we have any apologies for that? Second item is declarations of interest, and that's just for me, um, as usual, to uh, remind everyone that if there is anything either now we're aware of or become aware of at any point during the meeting, uh, please notify us accordingly so we can fill out the relevant paperwork and make sure that everything is kind of properly declared accordingly. Third item is the minutes of the last meeting. Um, can I move that those uh, minutes of the last meeting held on the 12th of July are approved as a correct record? Is that agreed? Agreed. Excellent. Uh, the fourth item, we weren't going to be having a presentation from Network Rail today. Uh, that's actually going to be at next uh, month's committee now on the 6th of September. So Network Rail will be coming to see us, but it's not today, it'll be on the 6th of September. Uh, and the fifth item is the Mercy Tunnels update. And Gary, Thank you, Chair. It's part of our, our regular update report on a quarterly basis to members of the Transport Committee. Again, the purpose of this report is to supplement uh, the, the corporate quarterly performance that the members receive around patronage data and just to summarise some of the key activities on the web that Mersey Tunnels and officers are involved with. So section 3 of the report just summarises some of those key projects and key activities. I'm pleased to announce that the members will be aware that the Kingsway Rewire uh, is now complete as a project and we've got those lights operating inside the Kingsway Tunnel. And sections 3.3 through to 3.6 summarise our positions around some changes to the toll collection system, most notably the toll hardware in the lane, the toll website and in lane car payments which are due in, uh, in September time based on current programme. 3.7 starts to introduce some of our major projects moving forward for this financial year, moving some of them moving into the next financial year. So 3.7 talks so about the M53 goal link resurfacing. In effect, that's the resurfacing of the Tunnels Approach Road on the Wallasey side of the Kingsway Tunnel. So it's going to stretch from Bits and Moss Viaduct through to the toll, the toll plazas themselves. And we've started design work associated with that. And 3.8 touches on some, uh, some work associated with both tunnels with our traffic lane control system, uh, most noticeably uh, in, in need of renewal for some time. Section 3.9 picks up uh, a, a little to Chester bike ride and the event on the 1st of July, again similar to what's reported on the ferries, there's a lot of activity that goes on, operations, support and events of this nature. We wanted to summarise to members uh, those activities on the 1st of July some changes that we've identified we can already improve the next year's event from learning from those experiences and we also do transparency and share those with members and 3.10 again just to summarise that from the decisions made at this committee and then latterly combined authority in February 2018 that the new £1 off peak fast tech charge has been introduced without any operational issues identified as part of that. Happy to take any questions. That's great, I'm sure a few questions and comments and some indications of Gordon. That's all in John, Tony. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the report, Gary. Uh, on page 13, 3.3, the, uh, the toll system refresh. Uh, the Kingsley Rewire was a, a £7.1 million pound investment. What has been the cost to date of that uh, toll system refresh? And down to the final pound, one of the, 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 the indication is approximately £3.1 million pound in investment there. That's all. Thank you, Chair. Um, as the lead member for Tunnels, I just wanted to place on record my thanks to the officers um, and all involved in terms of these key projects being achieved, in terms of the rewiring. Obviously, it was a long project, um, told refresh. Um, and in terms of the fast start, in terms of the benefit um, that it has brought, so it, 
there are a lot of work to be done and there could be a lot of improvement, but just in terms of moving forward, uh, there are a lot of good things that we have been that has been achieved. So just thank you. Thanks, Chair. Just first of all, a compliment from me to Gary. Thanks for the excellent report. And I also want to compliment on 3.2. £90,000 savings, perhaps even more importantly, 450 tonnes of uh, carbon emissions being reduced as well, which I think is absolutely superb. It's tying in with our agenda right across the local city region. We've just seen an electric bus outside, which is helping us move forward with that agenda as well. So I'm really pleased about that. So congratulations to everybody for that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. Sorry. Yeah, that was just a nice study. Uh, that's a report, it's very in depth. The curious of the fast tag for class one and class two is you know, class one <coughs> undermined passengers, <coughs> class two, nine or more persons. So there's a definite crossover there. If you've got a nine seat vehicle, eight, eight to drive, you've got a nine, nine seat vehicle. <coughs> What do you register that as? One or two. Um, the, the use of class two fast tag, when all this will be put into motion, it will actually be a fast tag because of apparently now you've got to use the fact that if you did a class two, you've got to use the fact that it's all in class, register as a sale. Okay, so what, what the current vehicle classification shows is that it, it's not actually determined by passengers, it's determined on passenger carrying capacity. So it's a number of seats inside the vehicle, okay? So in effect, if there's nine seats or more inside the vehicle, then it is it, it becomes a class two. If there's less than nine seats, so eight or less, it's a class one. And that's determined as well. There's another link into that one, the number of axles that that vehicle has. It's very rare for vehicles to have more than two axles with, with so it's, it's that differential that determines class one and class two. So in answer to your question, if there's a driver's seat and eight passenger seats, then there's nine seats inside the vehicle and that would be class two, class two. Okay. Coming back on Yeah, just that says, class one, passenger carrying vehicle with seating capacity for undermined persons. That's a for what to make the person, doesn't it? I'm looking at this now, and the class two is passenger carrying vehicle with seating capacity for nine or more persons. So, I think the way that that needs to be altered so that up to eight, class one, and nine or more, class two, just to avoid. I think we've also got to remember that the classification system that is determined in the Tunnels Act any amendments to that would require a Secretary of State order. So that's what, so it's actually defined specifically in the Act, so any amendments would require a legal change. So I think your point may be more, can we make it clear in our customer communication, which I'm happy to look at how we do that. But it, it, it's always a challenge, and when you have a, a, a definition or a, or a boundary of that nature, it's always a challenge for some people that will move on and say, oh, we, we need to be clear. And it often is a point of conflict on the plaza for the staff, where people were telling us, well, we've got three or four people in the car with them. And it is around the seating capacity that the vehicle has rather than anything else. It was a second point in the initial question around class one and class two and the use of staff booths. Okay, for anything that's not a class one, it requires to be manually classified by staff, so therefore it has to attend the staff booth to do so. Already, where we started behind the scenes was how we could look at automated classification to look at how we could address that and make that more convenient for customers. One challenge in that, unfortunately, is that there are very few automated processes on how we can count seats inside the vehicle itself. And that's something that's always been a challenge for us. We assume that would be great. Any further questions or comments? I can just echo a lot of those kinds of uh, comments that people have made, some really good progress in there. Particularly the fact that with the sort of uh, toll system refresh, we're actually getting kind of people through the tunnels 15% quicker, so people are getting a much 
better sort of service in their journey through the tunnel. So really good sort of work going on there, um, Gary accordingly. With all of that, if I can move the recommendation in paragraph two of the report, if that's agreed. Excellent. And moving on is item six next, and that's the West Coast Partnership Franchise Update, and Mr. Tom's presenting. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Transport Committee. Um, we've decided to uh, bring a paper to you today uh, to provide an update on the activity undertaken by Mersey Travel and Combined Authority office, Officers um, in our engagement with the three bidding companies for the West Coast Partnership Franchise, which will replace uh, in effect the Virgin trains that we see at Lime Street today um, from uh, the end of next year onwards. Um, uh, all three bidding companies um, got in touch with us as, um, as the Transport Authority um, to request um, political uh, high level discussions with the Metro Mayor and with, with our Chair and also um, technical level discussions with officers in um, specialist areas um, and the, the paper details uh, some of those discussions. A um, bit of information about the three bidding companies. Um, there is First Train Italia, which is an alliance between First Group, who currently on Transpan on Express Services, our local city region, and Tren Italia, who are the Italian state rail company who run high speed rail services in Italy. There's also um, NTR, who are, um, who, they run the Hong Kong Underground um, as their main operation, but they also um, have recently run a contract to run cross rail trains in London and also run. Uh, the South Western Train franchise um, out along the Waterloo as well. They will be working in partnership with the Guang Shen Railway Company who run high speed rail services in China. And finally, there is the Stagecoach Virgin and SNCF partnership. Uh, Virgin Stagecoach are current partnerships that run the existing uh, Virgin West Coast services, and SNCF are the French state railway company who run high speed services in France. Um, as part of our discussions with the bidders, we promoted the aims of the Liverpool City Region Long Term Rail Strategy, highlighting the need for two trains now between Liverpool and London um, prior to the opening of HS2 in 2026, when it is expected that that capacity uh, will be available. We fully believe that those trains are warranted as soon as possible, and we made our case uh, to each of the bidders um, on that. Um, a successful bidder will run the West Coast services um, on the existing West Coast Main Line until 2026 when HS2 opens, um, and then that company will run services on both routes, so the West Coast Main Line and on HS2's um, infrastructure. Um, it is expected that the majority of long distance services that currently run on the West Coast Main Line will transfer to HS2, uh, therefore releasing capacity on the southern end of the West Coast, and as more of HS2 is built, um, in 2027 and then in 2033, more services will run on more of HS2, therefore releasing even more capacity. And again, we will continue to work with uh, government <coughs> and um, with the successful operator to ensure the aims of the long-term rail strategy are met through trying to prioritise local city regions' aims uh, for the use of that release capacity. Um, fundamentally, though, uh, from 2026, we are expecting that there will be two trains now between Liverpool and London uh, using uh, the West Coast Main Line as far as Litchfield before then moving on to high speed to south thereof. Um, and then from 2027, when more of HS2 is built as far north as Crewe, uh, the trains will run on HS2 from Crewe uh, southwards. Uh, but again, it will be uh, two trains in there. Um, we also discussed um, issues such as ticketing and fares. Uh, future partnership working uh, with each of the companies and also how we might bear our own uh, stakeholder engagement in the future as well. Um, all the three companies have now submitted their bids to the Department of Transport. Um, an announcement is expected in summer next year, uh, so the evaluation process is underway now by the DFT. Um, and if there is any need for us to engage further um, as part of the recommendations, we've suggested that the, uh, the Rail Team for Travel uh, continue the link of that engagement. Um, we appreciate that the paper is quite light on some of the detail you might be interested in understanding. Um, as part of the uh, franchising process, we've had to sign non disclosure agreements with each of the three companies, and so uh, we have to be quite careful about what we can and can't say publicly. Um, but we, are, uh, we have pushed our, um, our aims and our objectives forward to the bidders. They have responded to us as part of um, those discussions, but we can't reveal any of the detail of that at this point in time. Um, what we're asking for today, um, as per the recommendations, is that the content of the report is noted, uh, that the um, future approach we've outlined in the report around engagement is endorsed, um, particularly um, endorsing the continued lobbying by Mersey Travel and the Combined Authority for two trains now between Liverpool and London as soon as possible, 
And we're also asking for the Transport Committee to seek the support of the Metro Mayor for a submission um, of a letter to the Secretary of State for Transport highlighting uh, the ends of the long term rail strategy in respect of two trains in Everton, Liverpool, and London. Um, I appreciate that's quite a quick canter through, but I'm happy to take the question. First up, Tom, I've got Gordon, and then Steve. Thank you, Jim. Um, I think that you've all covered all the interesting points that, that, that we're looking at. Um, in the recommendation, uh, I, did, I do look at C, and I think perhaps um, that the <coughs> endorsement of continued lobbying by Mersey Travel and the combined board of uh, should after London have as soon as possible to get it just it's only a tiny and clarifying what being said because uh, I do know I do know within the franchise that's uh, it's been looked at this commitment to twenty twenty six. Um, I have a difficulty in seeing the standing still to that length of time to be quite honest. And the reasoning is because um, we already have cities that compete with us. In a, in a good spirit, I'm sure. Um, not a football term to the old shit. But anyway, on the, on the side to that is, as we move that along, we're going to be falling way behind the developers will be looking at where their best location is. We're going to be out in the game for years if we don't get at least, we're not even going to get to the, to, to the point where Manchester is now. And I just think it's got Birmingham and you've got London all, all lining up and we're not in there and I think I don't want to sound negative on this I just I just, just, just feel it's so important for the future of people in this region that we did see a report in the Liverpool Leppo I'm sure that said for the first time this year we'd see more people travelling from London to Liverpool than the, to the opposite direction it makes me think of your comments and fears. Maybe it's only London that's going to fall. I don't want to press the point. The, the, it is interesting about the fears. I think maybe with additional capacity on there, some of the fear prices go down because I think uh, it can be high at the same time. But as you, uh, as you know, you can get good deals sometimes. But overall, I like the report with the little changes that have said. What I wouldn't like to, to be, uh, and just make a, 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 a bit of a political point. It's not accepting that franchising is the right way for us to go forward. I've just seen so many things going wrong with the model of franchising at the moment, where we see failed franchises, uh, those companies being given another crack at it when they're supposed to the risk and reward element. We've had uh, Chris Grayling has made promises. <coughs> I'll review the franchising system so that what we'll look at, we'll look at putting forward the uh, the actual specifications are not just based on, on price, based on the best outcomes. We're not really seeing a lot of that at the moment. So this is what we have, and this is what we'll deal with. It. But it, it, when I hear reports that say to me, we've got a, a train company from another country running trains here to make it turn back to them, I've got to tell you, it doesn't sit with me too well. But thank you for the report. That's not, not really ready for that, of course. Yeah, thanks for that, Gordon, and I'll endorse all those comments entirely. I really wish we were in a position by which kind of the uh, West Coast mainland and all the other railway operations were coming back under. The British states operate it instead of effectively the French, Chinese or Italian state operators, one of which will definitely win this contract. Um, unfortunately, the rules of the game have been fixed by the current government, so we have to make sure that whoever wins this absolutely delivers the right outcome for our region. I've got uh, Steve next. Yeah, I, I'm not going to go on too long because Gordon, as he finished, um, moved on to the area that I was going to sort of reiterate. There's a great discomfort, particularly among our members here, and I think amongst the general public, uh, who are quite open to the idea, as you said, of renationalisation of, of the railway system. And they've seen and suffered at the hands of franchises who have been dealt with and done in a similar manner, to say, the same format franchises let bidders come in. But what does the, the big risks surround some of these are Brexit. I mean who knows what, what will happen post Brexit to these type of arrangements. 
why should the British, why should Great Britain hand over its assets to make profits for another, another country's national rail or bus system? It doesn't make common sense. It, it just simply does not make sense to many members of the British public. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to go into the, the rounds of because we have to deal with the rules as they are. That's what we love to do. And I don't want to over politicise this committee because generally we try to get on uh, uh, across the board. But it needs minutes in somewhere members' concerns about this type of deal and project. We've seen so many fails, Gordon says. We've seen money going out of the country. And if we're in control and own it, uh, you know, we own the social value aspect of what's being done. We can dictate the type of employment, the, the type of employees, and all the, the great things that go with owning the own industry. And, and you know, really, really uh, uh, annoys members on this bench, particularly uh, about, about having to go through this process. But we understand we should play the game, whatever it's worth, to get the best of the public and where are. That's our job. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, thanks for that, um, Harry? <coughs> thanks, Chair. Yeah. Um, one of the recommendations we're asking us to support is the endorsement of proposed future budget for officers to engage with the bid process in a successful bid. Fully, fully support that. What I'd just like is a little bit to develop further the um, uh, 3.16 bid 19, which, which points out that there are going to be some resource and, uh, uh, implications with respect to service areas. The way I understand that is either the cost is more or the officers are going to have to leave other work to do it. Now, uh, that doesn't mean that I don't say I'm, I'm against it, I'm still in favour. We'd just like to better understand how we're going to address that, that issue. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Yeah, so um, the, the reason for mentioning that in the report was purely to highlight that it will be another part of the ongoing work over the officers. Normally, these franchise type um, conversations are generally confined to the rail team being with because they're very much focused on rail issues. but. Um, as we're moving into a world of smart ticketing and things like that, and clearly we have our own Walrus product in local city region already, um, I wanted to highlight that um, we, we really need to be involved in colleagues from the right parts um, of Mersey Travel and the Combined Authority to ensure that uh, we have a lot of joint up thinking um, across the piece. Um, so it might be that some of those departments um, may not be fully engaged with this kind of process uh, because they haven't had to be in the past. Um, so although rail, uh, as we will continue to lead, um, you know, just wanted to highlight that there is a, a need for a bit of integration. Um, we, we do normally cover this kind of activity within business as usual, but clearly for some of those other um, teams out right there, this doesn't count as their business as usual. That's all.
think that this question about social value should be started now because uh, if I'm wrong, but I think if I already get the contract, I'm not bothered because I, I'm the one who's won it. So I think perhaps we can ask to the chair and Metro Mayor Steve to, when we're dealing with these uh, companies, to put that in because I think it would do us an injustice if we do not start that discussion before they are already awarded the contract. Sure, we can make sure we pick that up. Sammy? Thanks. Uh, you, like you said earlier on, the uh, contract's till 2026, <coughs> so it's not a very long contract with the rest of the world. Contracts go on franchising. And then it automatically transfers to HS2. Now, we generally look at the future, and I'm looking at the future, and as to what to be colleagues have said in relation to. British owned, state owned rail systems and rail operations. Before 2026, I'd like to see a way the government's actually doing this. And, but there's going to be a cost to come out of these contracts or let the contracts run. But if it's automatically transferred to HS2, where would we stand at that point? Uh, so I'll, I'll have to clarify my answer this one, but I do apologise for any confusion. Oh, of course, so the actual contract uh, between the operator and government will last until 2029. Um, so the intention is that in 2026, the successful bidder will um, effectively become the de facto uh, runner of services on High Speed 2. Um, and they will run High Speed 2 on the West Coast concurrently for the three years from 2026. Uh, the government have also put a clause in um, as part of the, um, uh, the invitation to tender um, that a two year extension could be added. Um, so the, there is a chance that the successful bidder could be running these services from 2019 all the way through to 2031, which actually um, is one of the longest contracts uh, we've, uh, we've been aware of, um, uh, certainly in recent history, anyway, outside of this, um, uh, the arrangements we have with around the city region. I think the, the key point to is is what we will all have to keep a very, very keen eye on. Because if we think about the existing West Coast mainline franchise, it's actually been running for 20 years. Um, if you think about kind of when it was originally let and then when it wasn't re-let and then it was re-let badly. So I think it's one that we really need to keep our eye on very, very closely. And I'm with you 100% that we need that change of government to come in and do it radically different as soon as possible. Are there any further questions, uh, Patrick? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, an observation and then a couple of questions, really. Um, the, the bidding process really is dominated these days by kind of globalisation, by companies from across the world bidding for contracts in other countries that they actually naturally reside. Now, that's fine in some respects, although politically you may question it. But what we're, we seem to be entering into now, particularly with the election of Donald Trump, is protectionism across the world. So we're not talking about open markets, we're not talking about free competition. What we're talking about is um, protectionism. And that leaves us pretty vulnerable if that goes ahead on a global scale. Because effectively, by awarding these contracts to other uh, companies, nationalised or otherwise, it's almost like asset stripping. So we will be in a position whereby we will be totally subject to the vicissitudes of international protectionism where we've basically sold our own um, ability, our own strategic industries. My, my questions, um, I've got two. One relates to, um, I am aware that a few years ago, the gov this government introduced the Social Care Act, uh, sorry, the Social Value Act, Social Value in Procurement. I'd be very interested how they quantify and operationalize that definition, or how they define social value within their contracting procedures themselves on a national basis. And to touch on quite uh, probably colleagues made before, we can have discussions with um, potential bidders about social value, but what we need to ensure ourselves is we understand what we mean by social value. My definition of social value or could include looking at companies who do not siphon money off into offshore accounts, who do not basically steal money from the circular flow of income in this country to reinvest it somewhere abroad, 
So essentially taking away our assets. Um, so I think there's a question there about what are the, the government's operationalization of social value. <coughs> and we need to be able to define what we mean by social value. <coughs> I think, in, in fairness, that's probably a question more for the DFT and the government. So I'm, I'm conscious, Tom, you I might not know the, the answer, yeah. uh, answer I mean, to that. Yeah, but, um, but we, if, we, if, we if don't you didn't. I have no idea yeah. what it is. But if, if, if you have got some of that information, Tom, do you want to respond? Or? Um, I, I suppose to uh, uh, the previous question, um, it hasn't uh, come up in discussions yet with any of the bidders um, because of the nature of the conversations we have to have um, as part of the rules of the game, uh, which you also been touched on earlier. Um, I think it's something we can certainly take away and we will um, have to start to have discussions with our in the Department of the Transport um, in, the, in the franchising part of things um, to understand where they sit on these issues um, and uh, we'll have a private update at a later date when we have information. Awesome. Chair, can I just come back on that? Could we then define Mersey Travel's definition of what we mean by social value before we go into these <coughs> discussions? Yeah, of course we can. Yeah, and that's work that sort of Liz and the team are currently doing around social value at this moment in time. So, of course we can. Patrick, and we can bring that back as a, a more detailed piece of work. Yeah. <coughs> okay, any further questions? I was just going to sort of add um, a comment from myself. Uh, just on the sort of criticality uh, of us achieving two trains an hour from Lyon Street to, to London. Um, it's already been really touched on, but I want to kind of just continue to push that very hard on the basis that, as Gordon rightly highlighted, uh, there are more people travelling from London to Liverpool than in the other direction. That puts us in an almost unique position in the north of England of having an even stronger flow from the capital to us than our residents going down the capital. I think demonstrates the strength of the city, the city region, and the future uh, of our area. Gordon also pointed out about the kind of significant service that's already in place for uh, Birmingham and Manchester, and also parts of a few other cities as well. If you look at Leeds, for example, uh, this year the patronage between Liverpool and London in both directions has overtaken the patronage between London and Leeds, and London as a half hourly service. I also point to Newcastle, similar city with similar kind of geography, being on the coast, similar economic history, two hours. Two trains an hour is more than 100 miles further from London to Newcastle than it is London to Liverpool. And then we think about recent developments, not least with the Channel 4, sort of citing uh, the fact that we don't have some of the transport links that other comparable cities uh, have got. It's been one of the reasons we didn't choose to site their headquarters in Liverpool. For me, this is very, very simple, very, very straightforward. That there are no ifs, no buts. There should be two trains an hour between Liverpool, calling it potentially South Parkway and Runcorn, all the way down to London. It's what our demand requires, and it's what our city and city region uh, needs as well. I'm fully aware of the capacity issue on the West Coast main line, but I know from all the kind of detailed work that's been done, we do believe that we can uh, make sure that two trains an hour could be accommodated to our city and our city region. So it does need to happen. The final point I want to make is really just to sort of tribute to sort of Tom and Wayne and the rest of the team, because I know how hard our team really work uh, on this issue. It's a short kind of uh, document in terms of what's in front of you today, but I know the kind of real detailed sort of discussions that they get into to win that argument. And why, why I'm confident that we can achieve uh, what we're looking for is because we've got a fantastic track record. If you look at the way that previously, having engaged with other uh, train companies through this process, we were able to win the argument <coughs> and get services, not just to Scotland, but also look at the significant improvements in services we're going to get to and from Wales through the, the next Welsh franchise that will kick in later this year. There's a lot of hard work going here. Really, really pleased with that. Thanks ever so much for that. But it's incumbent on every single one of us, not just making sure we've got Steve Rotherham's back into this, to make sure we continue that very, very hard lobby and win that case for two trains an hour from Lyon Street down to, to Euston. Because if that doesn't happen, that will be the latest in a long line of kicks in the teeth from this government to this region. But it's not just a failure for our region if that doesn't happen. That's a failing for the whole of the UK because of the economic importance of the links between this city and the capital city. So with all of that, if I can move the recommendations in part yeah. two. Could I just interrupt for a second? Because 
uh, conduct and driver attitude have reduced by uh, 17 to 20% uh, across both of the operators. So a real correlation there between the training we provided, the action we've taken through the alliance and uh, the experience of the passengers. We've delivered Liverpool welcome training to all of our frontline customer service uh, staff, as well as the channel staff and uh, bus operator staff. We've uh, installed improved lighting and more efficient lighting at Liverpool and Liverpool One bus stations, so that's improved the uh, waiting environment and safety and security as well for, uh, for customers. <coughs> uh, you'll see in the appendix, uh, one of the appendix is to uh, the report, we've undertaken a 12 month. Uh, impact analysis of the St Helens bus network uh, review. The, the report highlights some key outcomes uh, for us from the review. And just to pick out the, the main ones, we've managed to uh, reduce the amount of money that we're spending on supported services, bus services in line with, uh, with our objectives around uh, a, re a reduced budget. But despite that, we've managed, we've still only seen a 3% rise in uh, in patronage over the same time. So the evidence there is pointing to a transfer of passengers from supported buses to commercial buses rather than people being unable to access uh, the bus network. So that for us is a, a really pleasing outcome. Uh, that a lot more detail than you'll see in the, uh, in the appendix. The report also goes on to talk about some of the milestones that are in progress for the Alliance. I'd be really happy to pick up any points that members may have In terms of the alternative uh, options business case, presented a report to the committee uh, very recently uh, on this. Uh, following that, the combined authority have given us the go ahead to commence the next stage uh, of the process, uh, the next stage of the business case. Uh, as a reminder, that's the, what we're doing in the outline uh, business case, and we've, we've now commenced uh, that progress. And again, <coughs> that process, sorry. Uh, and then, just to, again as a reminder to members of, uh, of what we're doing, we're going to be assessing the options of both franchising and <coughs> enhanced partnerships. We're going to be measuring those against the existing alliance <coughs> order to make a final recommendation to, uh, to the Metro Mayor in the future. Again, the report picks out some of the tasks that will be required to be undertaken to get us to at that point, we, we're now at the place where we have an outline delivery program for this work, which takes us to uh, early 2020. Then, in terms of supported bus service reform, very briefly, we've now transferred all of our uh, contracts to new terms and conditions, and all of our new contracts are, uh, are now awarded on, on the same uh, new terms and conditions, which really will now help us to support. Um, our efforts to drive up the quality of the supported network using the contracting process to do that. And we're supporting at the moment particularly the small, smaller operators in the transition to what that means in terms of what information they need to, uh, to provide. And I also just finally wanted to highlight a couple of uh, additional points in the report. Firstly, we're really pleased that uh, Arriva Click are going to be commencing their demand responsive transport solution. Uh, later this month, it's a completely new type of public transport uh, offering for our region, something we haven't seen before, with both booking and payment done through uh, through an app. We're really interested uh, to see what impact this has locally. In particular, um, the pilot that's happened uh, in Kent with Reba Click has seen really good levels of modal shift from car to uh, to this.